Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Directions Mag Geospatial webinar today, sponsored by our friends at Coordinates. I'm Barbara Duke, editor in chief here at Directions Mag, joined by our webinar producer, Lynette Qualia. Thank you to the geospatial community for being loyal to us for 25 years. Catch anything you missed over at directionsmag.com. We are excited to have Anne and Eli from Coordinates with us today. They have some great solutions for your data management regardless of the platform that you use for GIS. We're excited to learn more about coordinates and help improve our workflows. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Barbary. Um, yeah, so coordinates is designed to make workflows really easy and connect users with the data that they need. We are a data management platform so that people can choose whatever their favorite desktop software is for the work that they are doing, but still be able to share their data with their teams and customers. So this webinar is called Right Sizing Your GIS, and a key thing that that covers is cost control. Building a GIS team is expensive and often buying tokens can price people out of their work. And many people in an organization need or want some slice of GIS functionality. So using coordinates, you can then service a really wide range of people. Coordinates will run alongside your current tools and really extend your reach. We support open formats and we have a, an architecture we've built um, for managing data based on Git, but we've got more about that later. Um, we want to help empower you, empower your organization with the next generation of geospatial data management. And today um, we have our product managers, Hamish Campbell and Jonathan Ball, who will be um, looking out for your questions. Um, so please send those in and they will jump on and try to respond to you and we'll have a little time with them at the end. Um, but for now, we've got our sales engineer, Eli, who's going to give us a big tour through the platform. So thank you all for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you. Cool. Thanks, Anne. My name's Eli. I'll be taking you on a tour of the platform today. Um, I'm going to take you through what it looks like to consume data off the platform. So the customer's perspective. I'm also going to go through what it looks like for a, pub for a publisher to get data onto the platform. And then as Anne alluded to, we're going to go through this new distributed version control system that we have built that creates a new metaphor for collaboration and publishing. To get things started, I will jump into this slide. Uh, really the point of this is I want to give you some context around what is coordinates, how does it function, um, what is its architecture, if you like. So we're represented in the middle here, coordinates.com. This is where you come if you want to come to our umbrella site. Uh, we have a number of publishers. We've got a subset of them here on the left. We've been publishing open data for about 10 years. Um, what these guys on the left have in common is they all have the desire to get their data onto the internet and into the hands of the users in a more humanless, uh, if you like, easier to transmit data across. And so what coordinates does is it takes the data, allows users to discover data sets that they want to use, and then download it essentially in the format that they want and with the correct uh, projection that they require. So it's about getting the data from the data publishers into the hands of the consumers as quickly and easily as possible. These guys on the left are all on what we call a business plan. When you're on a business plan, that allows you to, uh, you get your own site, you get your own URL, custom domain, your own branding. Essentially, it's gonna look like you're running a site yourselves. Um, we provide the tooling, you provide the content. Um, so that's how that sort of works. Publish, I'll go through that in the demo. There's a number of different methods for ingesting data onto the platform and consume. There are a number of different methods of pulling data off the platform. While we fundamentally are in the open data, get the data in the hands of the users, um, we recognize that a number of users want to be able to programmatically interact with the data sets, and we provide a number of different services to enable that. In fact, some of our customers, like these guys, Integrape, they publish all their geospatial data up to our platform, and they've built an application which interfaces with the platform, so their customers come only via their application. They don't actually come to the coordinate site itself. The easiest way to get cracking is I jump into a session on coordinates, just show you how it all works. So first things first, 
this we call the top nav. This is how you uh, choose what you're looking at on your screen. It really depends what part of your journey you're on. If you are discovering data, you might turn the map off and you're in this view. Um, if you are downloading or exporting data, you will basically what you do is you add data to the map, any number of layers, any number of data types, and then you do an export. Um, I'll get to that shortly. So we'll turn the map off. A um, couple of things up the top here. Home, this takes you to our marketing site. Uh, this is where you can favorite data sets. So a lot of users will have a data set, they come back and they want to get recent frequent updates. So they'll favorite it. They can just come in, hit the favorites and their data sets will appear here. Browse data from here, you're searching all the publishers under the coordinates umbrella that have made their data public or that you have access to as your user. Um, from a user perspective, when you come to coordinates or to a coordinates run site on behalf of a publisher, you register with it. That gives you what we call a coordinates ID. All APIs that you create will be based off that ID, and that ID will control what data you can and cannot access on the site. Uh, publishers, this is just a view of all the different publishers that are on the site. So as people sign up for business plans, if they make data available, uh, on the internet, they will appear in this publishers. It gives you far wider reach of your data sets because people will recognize that you're publishing. The first um, up here, this is a keyword search. So pretty basic stuff, type your text in, go to that data set, um, interact with it. I wanted to talk a wee bit about these filters on the left here. You can use any number of them in combination to find the data that you're interested in. So you could set a publisher, you could set a data type, you could set a region um, and updated dates. But what I wanted to talk about quickly was this data type gives you an idea of what sorts of data we support. Under vectors, it's the usual suspects, points, lines and polygons. Under point clouds, this is a recently released feature and um, we're basically supporting the downloading of LAS point clouds. Under rasters, aerial imagery, um, bands, stuff like that. And under grids, rest attribute tables and grids. So a number of different data types, all of which can be added to the map and um, downloaded. If I jump out of here, and we'll just go back to the base view. I'll just start with this New Zealand layer. So we're fundamentally a New Zealand company. This is what we call a data sheet. It has a bunch of information about the data that you're considering downloading. We recognize that data sets are large, big bandwidth, um, large on your file share. So if you can find out as much information about the data set before you download it as possible, then that's going to help the end users out. So under the info tab, we've got some met, uh, some metrics. How popular is this layer? Often a good indication that you're in the right sort of zone. Um, we've got some about information, so metadata about the layer itself. Again, all of this is handled by the publisher. Under attachments, each layer that gets published, the publisher has the option to attach documents to it that give further information. So in this case, it's a data dictionary. That's quite a common maneuver. You can download that as PDF straight out of this data sheet or you can jump in here and view it uh, on in situ. Creative Commons licensing, we support out of the box. Uh, you can also, there's also a mechanism to create your own licensing if you need to attach your own licensing to the layer that you're publishing. Tags is for discoverability metadata. We support ISO 19115 and Dublin Core, both of which can either be downloaded from here or you can view it in the, um, in the browser. Details, what is the layer? This is the layer ID. Uh, I mentioned you can interact with layers programmatically. You'll want to grab a copy of the layer ID to plug into our APIs if that's what you're doing. So this is an easy place to find that. What type of data is it? Vector multi-polygon in this case. CRS, so our projection policy is that when you publish a layer, we store it in the projection that you have published it. Users on download can choose optionally to reproject um, on the fly to any sensible projection. I'll cover that off a wee bit more on the export phase. Feature count, how many features in the layer? Attributes, does it have the attribution that I require for my task? And then a bit of history and version control stuff. And uh, a, this is just a sample of the data. It's not the full data table that's accessible through the map viewer. 
So repository, I'll get to this later in the demo, but this is the new version control uh, system that we've put together. If I go to this history tab, the way that it works is if you're updating an existing layer, each time you want to do an update, you have to push that or ingest onto the platform that whole entire layer. We then scan it, pull out the deltas, so the inserts, mods, and deletes, and we create what we call a change set and update the layer with the current view of the data. So users can come in here and they can say, I want to create a change set and I just want to pull this particular um, part of the data. They might be wanting to keep the data set synced with stuff that they hold locally. So from here they can generate it, they can choose their format and they can download that and then they would apply that to their local data set. Um, it's quite an old school method of doing things. Cart radically changes that. What Cart does is, is as you ingest, as, as you upload or update your data set, we read the deltas out and create a commit. So if you're familiar with Git and GitHub, um, this might look familiar over here on the right. That's a diff map. It shows you all the changes that happened in that commit. Uh, it's got a cryptographic hash, so you can roll your data set locally back to that state and time. But um, as I, I'll go into Git a wee bit more at the end. So just a sort of a taster of where we're going with that. And then under services and APIs, this is a bunch of the different methods that you have of interacting with the layer programmatically. So if you wanted to hit it by WFS, which is Web Feature Service, um, you can create an API key from here. And when you create your API key, you can set the scope. That, I've already got one, so that plugs automatically into this URL. So it's simply a matter of grab that, plug it into your uh, consuming client, and you are now interacting with this layer by WFS. WFS change sets. Uh, this is, I've already mentioned that, so this is how you can create your change set. Each layer that we publish, you can hit by spatial query API. So some people have been building apps and they'll hit it using these uh, either vector JSON or XML queries. And this is just to give you a heads up on how to do that. Cart, I mentioned the cart cloning technique. Um, this is where you will grab the authentication URL. So if you're going to hit it by SSH, you can get that here. HTTPS, you can get that here. So again, it's just giving users as much information as possible around access with this layer. And this particular area will grow over time as we have more clients that are integrating with our platform. Um, so this is where we would advertise the availability for that option. So that's most of the things in a data sheet. The next filter I wanted to introduce you to is the regions filter. Every layer that gets ingested onto the platform, we geotag it on the way in so we know where it is on the planet. Um, given that we're talking to an American audience, let's go to America and look at some of the data that we hold um, in your neck of the woods. So if I drill down into New York, I'm interested in Suffolk County. So by hitting that button there, it's essentially pulling every data set on the platform from Suffolk County. Now from here, I can fire off my map viewer because I want to start looking at some of this data. The data set I'm going to play with today is this Suffolk County, New York schools. So if I add that to the viewer, um, that will appear over here. I can also add a couple of more layers just to show you how the layering works. So let's go for sewers and flood zones. So now that I'm into my, I guess you're looking at the more of an interrog spatial interrogation phase um, and exporting, I can in fact close out of here and I'm in a map centric view. Some fundamental stuff like I want to change my base map to satellite just because I like that. Um, it depends what data you're looking at, it might actually make more sense for you to use streets or terrain. I just think satellite looks cool. So we'll go with that. So from here, there's a number of things I can do. We've been building out what we refer to as GIS Lite, which is essentially GIS done entirely in the browser. Um, the idea being that we've got a number of users that need to interact with geospatial data, but they have no GIS proficiency and certainly aren't licensed to any GIS tools and have no desire to learn open source stuff. And so this might be as far as they actually need to go. They can load their data up. These map viewers are all attached to your uh, coordinates ID. So at any given time, if you make a bunch of map viewers, they're all stored in your history. You can regenerate them from here. 
Um, and in any case, if you don't close them, they'll just remain on your map taskbar down here. So here's the guy I'm building out now. Um, so I, the idea being, I might say, for instance, name this, and this could be my workspace. And so I can jump back into my coordinate session, open up my Suffolk County map, and there is all the things. If the publishers have updated the underlying layers, they will reflect in what you're looking at here. Things you can do in here, I can do a query. So depending on how far you've zoomed out, that's going to buffer the underlying features and it will produce the attribution for each one that I have selected. So here I've selected these guys. I can zoom around the map and look at the different things I've looked at. The attribution is here. Uh, this window is floatable. It is also dockable. In any case, it gives you an idea of basically a lot of people just want to know what is the name of my zone. Um, what is the whatever the attribution is. So these are just attributes that are in the layer. I can also from here, if I go to the ellipses, I can say show me the data table. Uh, tons of people just want to know data information or they want to know the whole data table. They can come here from here, they can zoom to different features on the map um, and they can stay abreast of what's going up with their, what's going on with their data set. The other thing you can do here is you can click info, which will pull up this data sheet again. There might be something you missed. You wanted to read more information about the uh, particular layer that you're looking at. You can change the draw order. You can turn layers on and off. So there's a few things you can do in here. Um, what it fundamentally is for is um, getting the data into your hands. So if I hit export, it takes me into the export flow. From here, we remind you that you can interact with this layer programmatically if that's what your needs are, but you probably are in here to export. What we do to keep uh, data flow to a minimum is we, by default, crop the export to the view that your map viewer was in. So if I jump out of here and say we zoom right into something and I go, right, I want that stuff. So that's going to crop it to exactly what I was looking at. I'm going to get a copy of each of these data sets and I can hit create export, which will start the process going. A couple of things to cover first is under coordinate reference system, we use GDAL, so we've got all the CRSs covered. Uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be exported in the CRS that it was published in. Um, you might decide you need it in WGS84 or some other uh, CRS that makes sense for the area that you're viewing at the time. Under Formats, these are all vector layers. We support exporting as an Esri shapefile, also do Esri file geodatabases. We do map info tabs and MIFs. Um, that's a CSV with the geometry stored in a wicket column. Geo packages we like and use a lot. Uh, that's a SQLite implementation. They're similar to file geodatabase insofar as you can have multiple layers stored inside them. Um, you can pull it out as KML. Google Earth, DWG for your CAD environment, PDF. So we've got a ton of users that will just store GeoTIFFs and then pull them out as DWG because they don't have the ability to convert them otherwise. So there's, as I mentioned earlier, a number of different use cases. What I want right now is I want the schools district, so I can turn those two off and I say create export. So that'll, in the background, do the clip, zip and ship maneuver. Uh, it'll just tick away. I don't have to stay here. I can cruise off and do other things. I've got a prog monitor up here. Once that download is ready, which it is now, I can say download please. So now I've got a zip file. Let's have a quick look in there. In here is a geo package containing the school's district data, and it's going to be in the projection that I'd specified on export. That's what it looks like pretty quick from a customer perspective, just to give you an idea of the functionality of the platform. Now I'm going to jump into a demo site. So this is essentially what you would be getting if you were a uh, publisher. These buttons across the top, I've already covered, data, map. If you are a publisher, you'll get this manage button. So now we can go into the manage, which is the back end of coordinates. And this is how you load your data onto the site. If I close out of the map, there's a bunch of options down here. These are all about configuration of the data sets and gestion of the data sets. 
Uh, the first one I wanted to cover off is users and groups. So we often get asked questions about if I want to do market segmentation and I want to give people access to different different layers um, and not make them completely public, how do we do that? The way we do that is you'll come in and create a group. Um, so you can say, make me a group. I'll make a group called Directions. If I create that group, I've now got a, a group called Directions. There are a couple of options here. If your users have registered with your site, then they will appear in this list and you can add them to the list via um, this mechanism, add users. So find the user, add them to the group, build up your group populations. This is really a one-time thing. As I mentioned earlier, that everything's API backed. So you could have an application that did all of your onboarding um, of customers, created the necessary groups and um, allocated them to those groups. You can also invite users, so send them an invite, they then log in and they will by default already be in the correct group. But that's a basically how you do it. There's no limit on how many groups you make. Users don't have to pay a license on this platform. They, um, You can have thousands and thousands of users and many, many, many groups and that is all just part of the tooling. You don't have to license each person. From a licensing perspective, you pay for an admin seat. So this guy here, the admin can access this back end and do all the configuration of the site. You may only need one, you may need many, depends on your users, uh, your use case. So that's how you do your group administration. And then the other thing I wanted to cover in here is how do you get your data up onto the site? The typical way of doing it for so like a Greenfield's first time load will be to upload across HTTPS, which essentially means you know like drop it into Dropbox same kind of deal we also have this concept of data sources um, these are buckets that contain data your site is um, able to have a direct connect to each of these so for instance Amazon S3 you can set up a cloud formation template connect your site to Amazon and then ingest data directly out of an S3 bucket um, then then essentially you pull the data across configure publish. Um, if that underlying data source changes, you can configure the layer to rescan and then update itself. So you can get sort of an auto update process flow working there. Same applies to all of these other sources. Um, this is an ArcGIS REST API. So think enterprise ArcGIS online portal server. And essentially you can create a connection to a feature service published on an Arc uh, REST endpoint and same thing, you can just rescan it, ingest, import, and then publish. It's a data gateway into your environment, just to, um, it's a mechanism for direct connect to a file server within your organization. A Postgres database that's internet enabled, we can connect to that, or a WFS. These are more for sort of mature publishers that are doing many, many updates, um, many, many layers. The easiest way to demonstrate how this works is if I jump in here, and I grab what I just downloaded there. So this is doing an upload from my machine straight into uh, the back end. Important to mention, we don't federate data. We take copies of the data, put it into the back end. Number of reasons for that. One of them is to reduce latency in the map viewer. The other is to uh, make it easier to download the data. It would be quite laborious round tripping otherwise. So that data has been uploaded. We do a scan, make sure there are no um, dodgy geometries in there. If there were, you'd be notified by email that we'd found errors and give you a clue as to what you might need to do to fix them. If I drill down into the zip and then into the geo package, so in the geo package, you could have had many layers in here. I just have the one that I downloaded. Suffolk County, New York school districts. Let's do an import. I'm going to give it a title of demo just so I know that I can recognize it later. This is where you fill out the about information that I've shown you in the data sheet view. This is where you can upload an attachment or browse to an already uploaded attachment and attach it to the layer. Owning group, I assign to directions. Categories, you get to de define all of your own categories over here under settings. Um, so for this, I might say add it to the education. It's just going to make it grouped with other like data and easier to discover. Under licensing, Creative Commons. So toggle the radio boxes according to your requirements. 
Um, and as I mentioned, you can, under settings, create a custom license if that's what you need to do. Primary key, if you're gonna do frequent updates, we use the primary key to pull the deltas and create the change sets. Uh, so you can assign that, you don't have to assign that. Um, we encourage it where possible, but a lot of people don't have the ability to have a persistent primary key across updates. Elevations, uh, simply a column in the data that contains Z values that we can extrapolate out to each vertice in a data set. Um, totally not necessary. In fact, you could do none of this, just give it a title, rock straight down to the bottom, do an import. A um, couple of other things before I do that. This is an EPSG 2263, which will be um, one of those NAD projections. You can reproject on import if you wanted to, or you can just leave it to the default. You can also edit your column, so remove working columns, um, get rid of things you didn't want. You might not want the shape length thing, it's just always floating around. So it gives you the ability to control the schema that you're about to publish, and then you hit import. From import, we're now going to be copying it into the main system, hooking up all the services, creating all the tiles that are going to be presented to the end users in your coordinate site. You don't need to hang around here either. That will just tick away and do its thing. Doesn't usually take very long, but we don't have lots of time. So I had already published it here. A couple of things I wanted to cover off in here. Um, under access, if I change this to anyone can view, that is now a public data set that anybody can um, register to download, i.e. get a coordinates ID and download. So essentially you've just created an open data portal, boom, hit that one, I will not. Um, the other important thing here is add group access. So if I was to say build up a um, bunch of users in this directions group, and if I was to configure this layer like this, I can add a number of different groups to the layer. What this essentially means is this data is closed to the public and anyone in the directions group can access the layer. And um, that's gonna go for API programmatic or through the, inter, uh, through the interweb as well. Uh, the other thing in here I wanted to point out was we use automatic cartography style of, in the case of polygons blue, um, you have the ability to create a new map style. So what I've done here is essentially just created a new one that is gold, and then you make that the default under this ellipsis. And that means that anyone viewing the data set through your site will see whatever styles you've done. We use Carto CSS for this, so you can do a bunch of different things with thematics and uh, you know attribute-based labeling and whatever you want to do. It's all um, you'd have to head on over to Carto CSS and read how to do that, but um, the functionality exists there. So if I now jump back into the front end or customer viewing site, I can open up this layer that I had downloaded and imported. Um, you can see that it's got the two different styles. You can actually switch between them. So if you were streaming this layer, you could stream it with the automatic cartography, or you can use the pretty gold cartography. And I can add it to a map, and I'm back into the same old flow that I was before. So it appears here, I can zoom to it, I can download it. I can zoom right into it. In any case. So that's what it looks like from a customer perspective and from a publisher perspective. If I jump back into the back end, I can go into manage data. I can see that that layer that I published has finished. So here it is, I can add that to a map. Um, it is now part of your environment, it's private. I can come back and change any of these settings at any time. So at import time, you could do virtually nothing and then come back in, change the title, add a description. Depends on how you're doing it and you could have done it by API and then you can come in and toggle your access or change your cartography. So once it's in the system, it's in the system, it's, um, will appear under Manage Data. And that, I guess, is really all I want to say about um, publishing. So what I want to jump to now is, um, back to the slideshow. I just, I wanted to do some explaining about, around this cart. So what cart is, is it's a wrapper around Git. What Git is, if you are a developer 
um, you will be familiar with it. If you are not, you don't need to know anything about Git. It's it's built into the mechanism. You do not need to know Git. You do not have to learn Git. Um, you can just benefit from its um, awesomeness. So what Git does and what Cart does is it's distributed version control. It's the go-to version control system for web development globally. What we have done is we've built a wrapper around it and we've taught Git how to understand geospatial data. So it means you can make a bunch of edits to a layer, roll that up into a commit that gets stored in the history of the repository and you can jump around versions of history if you like. And so it means it's just sort of it gives you an auditable trail of work that's done on a layer and it gives you the ability to roll back and it means you can have multi people working on the same layer in different branches, merging their branches, all the Git things. Like Git, cart is command line. Tons of our users are going to be allergic to command line. So what we've done is built this coordinates desktop app. It's a GUI that wraps around cart and it allows you to do all of the Git-like operations in a uh, visual user interface, which a lot of people are more comfortable with. So they can do stuff like clone a repository, which means get a copy of the data onto your machine. Um, then once they've done a bunch of edits, they can jump back into the app and commit that with a commit message and then push it back up to the repository. Um, easy way of interacting and collaborating. And from a coordinates cloud perspective, think the analogy is what cart is to Git, coordinates is to GitHub. So our backend is heavily populated with repositories. Every data set that is ingested is mirrored into a repository, which means your users can either go through all of the stuff I was just showing you on the site, or they can just use this desktop app or the command line or a few other things we've built and clone the layer down and it gives them a direct connect to the back end uh, and you're not pushing massive amounts of data around, which I'll go through shortly. Just quickly, distributed version control in a coordinates context, top of the tree, coordinates cloud, repos, tons of them. User comes along, clones down a repository, gets the repo and its entire history. You can do a shallow clone, which means you only get the present state of the data. It's gonna make it a smaller download. Um, once you've got the repo, the data will be sitting in a working copy. The default working copy we've gone with is GeoPackage due to the fact that it's somewhat vendor agnostic, meaning that uh, open source folk can work on it, ESRI folk can work on it, FME folk can work on everything. Um, it was just the most sort of easiest format for all different users to be able to access. We also support, if you need uh, RDBMS styles, we support Postgres, SQL Server, MySQL. And uh, this is one of the areas we're looking to expand out different working copies. Um, an obvious one would be File Geo Database, which has been discussed. Uh, the way it works is, yeah, you've got your Esri guy, he pulls the data down, makes a whole bunch of edits, and then he'll update his local repository, push that back up to the coordinates cloud, at which point any other users that pull that same repo down will benefit from the edits that have been made here. So you might have open source user comes along, they pull it down, they make their edits, push it back up to the cloud. The beauty of it is you can have two users from different ecosystems collaborating on the same data set without needing to do transformations or, you know, Dropbox version one, version two, version three. Um, and every commit is geohashed, so it's legit. The data that you're publishing or pushing up to the coordinates cloud, that can be published. You can publish a layer off either the main or any of the other branches that you create. Um, so it gives you a auditable history of editing and publishing. Easiest way to show you is to jump again. Whoa. Into the app itself, which I have somewhere here. Can be quite hard to find because it has exactly the same UI as the website. Um, just quickly here, we've got the repositories that I've already pulled down on the left. I've got all of the data sheets on the right. Um, these are the same data sheets that I was just going through on the website, same filters, same everything. So once you become familiar with one, you already know how this works. Um, you can also kick off map viewers, do your export flow from here. This is an executable that you install on your own system that you can download from our website that has no license associated with it. So completely free, it just is extending the ecosystem of coordinates so that users can, for instance, put all their data in a site. Their users 
um, can or the consumers can use this application to pull the data down and it keeps it updated nicely. An example of such is this New Zealand building outlines layer, which I cloned a long time ago. As the publisher puts updates up, I get a notification and I go, right, cool, I can up, I can apply that, that pulls it down and it synchronizes my local copy with the publishers. I get a view of the diffs, so what has happened in this commit and all of the different table views and I can blast around and have a look at it if I want to. You could have a QA script that QA had, did sort of QA procedures across the update before you applied it, or you can just hit apply updates and that will take that commit, not the whole data set. These are big data sets, um, as I'm sure you're all aware. So you don't want to be downloading gigabytes every week. It's much easier if you just pull a really atomic update. Um, just to show you a bit of cloning, if I hit the star button, it shows me all my favorites. I can find the Suffolk County, New York school districts, and I can say, get and I can do a spatial filter this is a bit of a mention um, what happens here is if I was to zoom down to an area of interest I can pull down just that area it's a bit more special than cropping insofar as I've got my repo local I zoom down to a small area I can still make edits and push back to the master remote I don't have to have pulled the whole layer so it allows you to do a spatial filter of a much bigger data set, do a bit of work on an area, push it back up to the source, and um, the broadband companies are happy you haven't killed them. So if I do a get, that's now going to just do a clone of that layer. Um, jump out of here real quick, let's go and have a look at what a repo looks like. So repo, repository, folder, same thing. I go into the folder, I've got a bunch of cart and git hidden files. These are the brains behind it all that do all of the storing of the trees of history. And um, when you switch out from versions, this is the controller. Um, under the geo package, that is where the data lives. And that is what a repository looks like. So the Suffolk County that I'm just pulling down, that looks like it's arrived. So that will now appear down here and I can jump in and have a look at what's in there. I won't because we're short on time. What I wanted to go through real quickly is a, this is an Auckland Airport demo repository. Um, I've already cloned it down. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six different layers in it. And it just gives you a good indication of how you might go about doing collaboration on a data set. So if I go open up an arc, Pro session. This is pointed at the geo package, which I've cloned down. So it's one geo package, many layers. And in here, I'm going to do an edit. I'm going to create something, maybe a new runway. Let's pop it over there. So if I save that, that's now been saved to this layer. Kind of of interest in the geo package, there are, you can have lines, points, polygons, and you can make changes across multiple data sets, roll them into one commit. If I jump back into the app, uh, cart has been monitoring the geo package. It has noticed that I've built this new runway. I'm now gonna say, I'm gonna call that new runway and I'm gonna commit it. That's going to add that to the version history of the repo and it'll appear in this list here. Blue around it means you've made a new commit but you haven't pushed it up to the site yet. So if I now go push, that's going to send that off to the coordinate site where the repo lives. And at this point, Barbara, if you could switch to Anne, then she can show you what it looks like at her end. Hi, so I'm working on the same data set as Eli has just shown. Here's my Auckland airport. But unlike Eli, I actually work in QGIS because I'm on a Mac. So if you can imagine, I've been working away at this and I've spoken to Eli before and I know that he's going to push some data or it could be a large team. Um, and I will come into my coordinates app here and hit check. 
So this is making a call to the cloud, the coordinates cloud, to see if anybody in this massive team who are all working on this data set have made any changes. So I can see here, yes, we have a new runway and it looks fantastic and all the attribution is perfect. So I'm going to hit apply updates and it will bring down just this tiny little piece of data. And then when I hit refresh in my QGIS, which is right here. This is a live demo. <laughs> It appears. So I can now add my hanger to his runway. So I will choose building outlines, edit. I'm going to add a building right here. So I've got a place to park the planes once it, once they've been landed. Save, hit OK. Here's my new building. Hit save. All still in QGIS. Then when I jump back into my app, which is which has been my coordinates app, which has been running in the background. It automatically detects again that I've got one uncommitted edit. I'm going to add this because it looks perfect. Um, and we're going to call this hanger. There we go. And then I'll hit commit, which is now bringing this change into my data set. And I've got another little step here to be able to go, yes, I'm happy with the shape. Attribution's awesome. And I'll hit push. And at this point, it is pushing this tiny little piece of data back into the cloud so that the rest of the team can see um, my changes. So that's collaborative editing with CART and QGIS and all the tools. So on that note, I'll hand back to Eli to show what he can see. Cool. Thank you, Anne. Um, if I jump into my repo, just to show that it um, goes both ways between pro and I can do a check. It's going to find any updates. Green means new stuff. I hit apply updates. And that's going to take Anne's changes, apply it to my local data set. And if I jump back in here and do a refresh, then cool. So I think I'll just leave it there, mindful of time. Um, I was going to do some stuff around AcuGIS. So just real quick, we've got AcuGIS um, plugin, so you can integrate everything you do straight into here. It means that you can find a data set you're interested in. You can add it straight to your map. You can go add, cool. And that's going to come across as a WTMGS. Uh, I can also do a get, which will clone that into a particular directory like that and i can say okay and so now that's doing a clone so the idea here well, i won't go into it too deeply but you can do all the good stuff within of these within this environment it means that your users can be sitting in their QGIS session they can pull data across they can do edits they can push back up and meanwhile at the other end you've got a um, server sitting there that's going to publish all of the things that the users are doing but that's probably a conversation for another day so We'll park it there and I'll hand over to Jonathan and Hamish to see if there were any questions. Hi Eli, thanks for the demo, that was awesome. Um, I've got a, uh, well, I'm sort of sticking two really simple questions together. Um, can you go back and quickly show me the, the favorites tool? How easy it is to get a few of your sort of commonly visited data sets into the map viewer? Uh, sure. So if I was in coordinates.com, I can fire off a new map viewer. I can go into my favorites. You can just hit the star essentially. So we just had a cyclone the other day and we've published, one of our publishers published a bunch of data here. So anything that's starred will appear in this list. From there, I can add it to the map change that back to terrain and so i could build up a map with a bunch of things here and i can then zoom on in and check it out and then again as i mentioned earlier you can rename that cyclone yep. save it it'll appear in your history once you've oh you've uh, named it now can you uh share that maps show me how easy it is to share that with the rest of the team if i've got a say a 
a team of lawyers that aren't really GA savvy, um, how easy we can show them a, a selection of data that we've put together. Risky maneuvers. If I go to this link button and I hit copy to clipboard, I can email that to someone, they can chuck it in a browser, assuming they have permissions to all of the layers that I've put in, it will recreate the map viewer on the fly. Um, they can then save that to their environment. Um, so that's how you'd share it. And one of the future directions we're looking at is we're calling published map viewers. So you would essentially take that link and throw it into an iframe, put it on your website, and uh, it would give you an easy way of publishing data to the world or whoever you're wanting to show it to. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Eli. Cool. Now, we had a question. Um, are these apps free to download? Uh, definitely are. So they are from an end user's perspective. There is an associated cost to the publishers for usage of the layer. It's pretty minimal. But um, yeah, as I mentioned, anybody can come on and register with your site. Um, they can build up a map viewer. They can then hit export. No cost, this is gargantuan, you probably wouldn't do that, but um, I, just to give you an indication, short answer, no, this is how you do it, and it's free to end users, as is uh, programmatic interaction with the lab. Cool. Great, well, thank you all so much for joining us for this tour this morning, um, and thanks Jonathan and Hamish for the questions as well. Um, we've covered a lot here, so please do get in touch if you're interested to learn how coordinates could work for you and your teams, because most people might have a couple of workflows, um, and there is a huge range of ways that we can connect with people. So yeah, send us an email or get in touch through our form, which will come out in the um, directions email. And I want to say a big thanks to Barbary, Lynette, and the directions team for supporting the industry as well. So yeah. Have a great day. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks again to the team here for sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. We hope that you'll go out and make it a great day. Tell a friend about coordinates and directions magazine. Thanks, everybody.